Good afternoon, good morning, good day to you, wherever you are in the world. I want to welcome you uh, again to another episode of the Entrepreneurs and Life Coaches Roundtable. My name is Samuel Harrison. I'm the owner and proprietor of Best Life Coaching LLC in the Washington metropolitan area. And you know what I always say, always pointing people to the abundance within. I'm going to ask my co-host to introduce herself as well. Greetings, my name is Barbara Musgrove and I run You Can Turn Your Life Around, life coaching for those age 50 and older. All right, and our other co-host, uh, Charlene Dickens, could not be with us today for this uh, pre-recorded session, but she is with us in spirit and we certainly wish her well. We are excited today because uh, during the month of July, the Entrepreneurs and Life Coaches Roundtable, we've been uh, conducting a series of interviews on businesses in the United States. As the COVID-19 pandemic comes to an end and businesses of all sizes are reopening, the ELCRT believes this is a good time to talk about the role of business in the formation of the United States, business ventures among African Americans in the United States, and the influence and impact of coaching and other professional development endeavors. So today is, our, is the last of our series, and we're going to be interviewing uh, my friend, my bishop, and my coach, uh, the Reverend Dr. Darrell R. Pulley uh, from St. Petersburg, Florida. He is an organizer and an outstanding counselor and life coach and you are in for an absolute treat today. So with that, Dr. Pulley, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me, absolutely. We are just so incredibly pleased uh, to have you participate in this uh, session uh, on business, on the business of coaching. And so will you please take a moment and tell us about yourself and your business and what it is, uh, what, what your business is about and what led you to the development of your businesses? Well, um, I am, I got a lot going on. I'm the spiritual leader of today's church, Tampa Bay. Uh, we're one church in two locations, St. Petersburg, Florida, as well as Tampa, Florida. Uh, I'm blessed to be the presiding prelate of the Church of the Everlasting Kingdom. And we have local assemblies, ministries, and businesses all across the United States of America. And we're even stepping into other countries. I'm also the proud father of twin daughters, Brittany and Courtney, uh, and the son, D. Reginald Pulley II. And I have a lovely granddaughter, Tyler Jade. Um, I'm excited also to be the founding president of Alpha New Omega Fraternity Incorporated, uh, which is a Christian fraternity uh, that has chapters all over the world. And I, what else I do? I'm the, um, I am the president of Interfaith Tampa Bay and uh, the president of the Gathering of Pastors here in St. Petersburg. Uh, author, got several books out there that can be found on Amazon on all kinds of subjects from soup to nuts. Uh, and so I'm grateful to be able to be actively engaged in the work of helping people be their best selves and live their best lives. Well, I uh, was on a trajectory uh, to be a minister, a uh, full-time minister and uh, my wife, uh, Alicia, died 10 days after our twin daughters were born. And so I was uh, um, instantly a single dad and a grieving widower. And um, I was had a full fellowship to be a seminarian at Princeton. And my life just totally, totally changed. Um, I had a small congregation at that point um, in Baltimore, Maryland. And um, I was devastated. And a lot of the tried and true sayings that the church often offers did not give me comfort. Like earth has no sorrow, that heaven cannot heal, and God is too wise to make a mistake, and God needed a flower out of his garden, so he picked your wife, or he needed another jewel in his crown. In fact, not only were they not helpful, they caused me to become infuriated. And I did not, um, feel that I can really move forward in ministry. So I resigned um, from pastoring uh, Church of Us and Kingdom at that point was a local assembly. And I took some time to work on me, to heal me, because one of my parishioners came up to me and said, Pastor, what are we going to do? We don't have our first lady. And I was getting ready to cuss them out. 
Uh, what do you mean you don't have your first lady? I don't have my wife. I don't have a mother of my children. You talk about a first lady. So I was angry. I was angry. And I knew that I could not effectively do ministry being bitter. But one of the things the Spirit said to me in meditation is that a lot of your colleagues have been trained to preach and teach, but they have not been trained to do counseling or to be with people in pain. When you move them from behind the comfort of the pulpit, they really don't know what to say. So what um, I was uh, guided to do is to forgive all of my colleagues and to get into some counseling myself. And through counseling, I discovered that I desired to become a counselor. I went to Loyola College of Maryland instead of Princeton uh, to get a master's and then a CAS and then a doctorate um, in pastoral counseling and psychology. And I began to heal myself as well as learn how to heal others. My prayer was, Lord, give me the tongue of the learn that I might speak a word in season to the person who is weary. And so it changed my life from just focusing on theology because out of 90 credits at Princeton, only nine credits were based on pastoral care and counseling. And so much of what people need was not even taught to the seminary. And so it totally changed my life um, and it put me on the path of doing counseling. So I started, um, I became a licensed uh, clinical professional counselor in Maryland, um, nationally board certified in, as a, a professional counselor. And I started um, a business, Life Counseling Services. Life Counseling Services is 24 years old and I have never advertised. Not once have I put out a card or uh, advertisement, but it's all been by word of mouth. And that business has been tent making for me, like the Apostle Paul, for 24 years. It started with one client. I believe the Sam and I met together um, at a Sam actually introduced me to this one client. Um, and I, he's given me permission to give his name, Rodney Smothers of the United Methodist Church. And from that one client, I can trace 80 to 85 percent of my business over 20 years from that one interaction with that one client we went out to dinner and um he said uh what do you do i said well i'm getting ready to start opening a counseling business he said i'm gonna be your first client <laughs> i said really and from that one client um i mean hundreds of people i've seen over 24 years and like i said 85 percent of those clients i can trace back to Rodney Smothers, which was my first client. Um, I was guided uh, by one of my counseling supervisors not to take insurance, um, but to do a sliding fee scale for services and to let people, uh, my scale currently goes anywhere from $50 to $250 based upon what people are able to afford to pay. I do see it as a business, a ministering business. It is a business that does ministry as opposed to a ministry uh, that does business. It is a business that does ministry. Um, and I do counseling. I do coaching. I also do clinical supervision uh, for those that need clinical supervision as well. Uh, I also developed the life model for spiritual direction because so many pastors were doing counseling um, and were not qualified or licensed to do so, but yet their parishioners was coming to them. So we started um, life counseling um, services and we developed life model for spiritual direction, which is uh, mental health ministries within churches. So that like kind of like a Stevens ministry where lay leaders and ministers can be trained um, to do some short term intervention type of work and then have a referral service to give them to uh, clinical professionals uh, to take them further. So um, I guess that's in a nutshell how I got into counseling and what I do. I hope I answered your question. <laughs> Did. And, and I tell you, did, I, I guess because I know so much of this and I'm so excited, I, I must admit, uh, I was hoping you would mention the life model for spiritual direction because that was one of the uh, foundational courses that you developed. Absolutely. And it's over 20 years old, still going strong, and yes. it is one of the most impactful programs that has been uh, in a lot of the uh, uh, charismatic mainline churches and has been so beneficial. So. Uh, 
uh, your career your career is just so exciting and uh, sounds so rewarding. Our viewers would also like to know how important coaching has been to you and in your your development. And uh, would you talk a little bit about it? And also, have you identified an appropriate coach for yourself? Yes, I do have a coach. I've had different types of coaches over my life, over the span of my life. I've had financial coaches. I've had relationship coaches. Um, I've had therapeutic coaches, spiritual coaches. I just have found the benefit of coaching um, different from counseling. Coaching is more, for me, it's more goal-oriented and specific. This is the goal. This is the plan to get there. And these are the steps that we need to take in order to reach this goal. So I have found the benefit of coaching through of coaching throughout various stages and various seasons of my life. So it has been extremely, extremely helpful. Um, and I have sought out professionals who uh, specify and specialize in a particular area when I've needed it at that particular time. Great, great. So, um... When you think back over your life and over your coaching business, uh, what's a mistake or a poor decision you made uh, and now you wish you could have avoided? Well, one of the things that I had to do was be honest with myself about being a holistic coach. Mm -hmm. That um, there's some coaches that might focus on just physical things. Some might focus just on mental and emotional things um, and some focus on spiritual things. I see myself as a holistic coach, as an integrated coach, and I have taken a few clients and I learned from these experiences that if a person is not interested in the spiritual aspect of their development, then I'm not the coach for them. If we can't talk about God or spirituality or bring, not that it has to be the focus of our work, but that is an under pinning it is a uh, it is a big part of who I am and so I need to be able to share and to tap into that spiritual piece with the person and look at whatever their goal is also from a spiritual perspective so I had a couple high paying clients that desired me to coach them but they were not interested in the spiritual aspect and so maybe halfway through quarter way through the coaching they said you don't seem to be as engaged and um and i had to be honest and say i was not because i knew that some of their issues were also spiritual in nature and they didn't want to tap into that so i had to refer them to some other coaches that were not into that particular aspect and to then redefine myself as being a holistic coach and to tell people when I first take them that I bring all that I am to the coaching situation. If that's not something that you're interested in, then I have a list of colleagues that I can refer you to where that doesn't have to be a part of what you do. Wow, amazing. Dr. Musgrove? Thank you. Bishop Pulley, you've provided us a great deal of information. I really like the way you manage that decision and how you redirect it and you're able to redirect people who are not interested in the type of coaching that you offer. Um, I would like you to tell us something about what you consider your greatest achievement during, during the course of your career. I think one of the greatest achievements that I feel is um, being able to supervise um, other coaches and counselors and people who are breaking into the field, but they need supervision. They need somebody to bounce some things off of as they are developing as a therapist or clinician, as they are developing as a coach, to be able to be a supervisor or a coach to the coaches, um, as I would call it, has been the most rewarding part of me because so many people need coaching and the more that we can get coaches that are trained and skilled and confident in who they are and what they have to offer i feel the better this earth will be amen so what have you been learning from coaching other coaches i've been learning that you must bring all of who you are to the coaching situation and that every life experience that you've had prepares you 
to be able to coach others and that you will have a client that will tap into something that you thought that you would never even be in touch with, that you were totally done with and over with. And that client will pull on that particular piece of your experience. So for me in coaching, it is bringing all that you are, all that you've experienced, because everything in your life prepares you to be the effective and efficient coach that you are. Thank you. So you've been doing this for a quarter of a century or a little yes. more, and you started being prepared for this even before that time. So our viewers will want to know, well, what's keeping you going in this uh, post-pandemic 21st century world in which we find ourselves? How do you keep yourself going? Well, what I do um, is that I'm always working on me. And um, I think that the best coaches are the people who are constantly working on themselves. And so in the midst of all this going on, I do the uh, precautions of hand washing and sanitation and physical distancing and the mask. I've been trying on shields and masks and all different kinds of things to keep myself safe. And that is the external. But there's a bigger part in doing this that I can control because those things, I can control them to a smaller degree. But the greater degree that I've experienced is going within and taking care of myself. That I know that I build and boost my immune system when I get my proper rest, when I'm drinking water, when I'm exercising, eating uh, fruits and vegetables as in getting away from some of those <laughs> things that are not good for you um, and letting go of stress and tension that that builds and boosts my immune system because I was created with an immune system and the more I boost that the greater uh, chances I will have to not get COVID because if I come in contact with it my immune system system will fight it. So I do deep breathing as a part of my daily practice. I'm into meditation, stillness and silence, um, denials and affirmations to keep myself in a positive state of mind. And also I just feel that forgiveness is so important. I tell people I'm always sitting on ready. I'm sitting on ready to forgive because somebody's going to say something, do something intentionally or unintentionally. And I'm going to have to forgive. I'm going to have to release it and let it go. So I'm always preparing myself to be in a posture to be able to forgive, whether they ask for it or not, whether they admit that they were wrong or not. I'm always sitting on ready to forgive. So those are just a few things that I do to keep myself grounded. Wow. Sounds like a very uh, immense list yeah. of things that you continue to work on yourself externally and internally. Absolutely. And of always being ready to let go of those hurts to forgive. So if you put all those together and maybe there's something else you didn't mention, is there one or two tips you would give to someone who's saying today, I, I like what I hear. I want to do that. I want to be a coach. What's one or two tips you'd give that person? is that um, the best thing that you can do, I feel as a coach, is to be in tune with what's going on with you. That you're not projecting that onto the client, that you are in touch with your own stuff, that you're able to draw your own line, that you know what your limitations are. I teach my uh, coaches and uh, clinicians, you need to be able to draw your line at any time and know what your limitations are, what you don't do well, know what your issues are, what you're working on, know what you need in order to be your best self, and know your expertise, know what you're good at. So the better that I know myself, then the better I'm able to serve others. Thank you. Wonderful. Dr. Pulley, this has just been uh, an amazing interview with you. And uh, we're gonna close with one other question because I know you have been uh, at the forefront of this in uh, St. Petersburg, but we wanted to ask you, uh, in the midst of all this going on with the Black Lives Matters protest, and uh, what do you see coming out of this entire international Black Lives Matter protest slash movement? What's your, what's your theory? What's your, what's, what, what are you hearing about that? Well, um, 
I was really into the Black Lives Matter uh, movement, and I was certainly propagating it. And I am blessed to have colleagues of various uh, races and cultures and creeds. And so I asked them what they thought about Black Lives Matter, and they were like, yes, Black Lives Matter. And I said, well, what do you think about Black Lives Are Equal? And they coughed, and they needed water, <laughs> and they turned red, and they had to excuse themselves and go to the bathroom, that they were comfortable saying Black Lives Matter, but they were not comfortable saying Black Lives Are Equal. And even though I don't consider these people to be racist or whatever, it was not a conscious thing of equality, saying matter and equal just were not synonymous for them. You know, because dogs and cats matter. But the idea is that we are equal, that all lives are equal. And it's gonna have to go beyond Black Lives Matter because that just says don't kill us. Mm -hmm. But the movement that we must continue is that we're equal. That's what Dr. King was fighting for, mm -hmm. that we all would be able to sit at the same table and not be judged by the color of our skin and by the content of our character. Mm -hmm. And so I am really propagating that black lives are equal and, and encouraging people to say beyond matter, I beyond matter, I am equal that there is no difference, that we are equal because we're all God's beloved offspring. And I've been dealing with people and getting cotton in the mouth and, you know, sweaty palms and all <laughs> kinds of stuff when they say equal. And I just work with them and let's, let's work with that idea because I don't think that people really think about their internalized um, racism because matter is, a, it's a good beginning. It says, do not kill us but it doesn't speak to financially equal, intellectually equal, um, that we're equal in all ways across the board. And so I've been really working with Black Lives Are Equal, beyond matter that they are equal and getting pe people to work with that idea and to see how challenging that is for them to say and entertain. So I've been just working with different people with equality and what that means, that um, it's one thing to tolerate, it's another thing to even accept. Mm -hmm. But the greatest thing that we can do is celebrate diversity, um, racially, as it relates to or various orientations, religions, that we celebrate, we're not just tolerating you, we're not just accepting you, but we celebrate the unique manifestation of the divine that you are and so i'm into the celebration getting people to celebrate the essence of who they are so that's just a little bit about what i've been doing and uh with this movement <laughs> well dr pulley we absolutely uh celebrate all that you are and and all that you are doing in the earth uh i'm so uh proud uh that you have made a deposit in the Entrepreneurs and Life Coaches Roundtable. You were a part of the inspiration of me uh, starting this whole thing. Oh, thank you. Uh, and thank I'm so you. grateful for all that you do for me and the encouragement behind the scenes that you give me uh, and keep pushing me forward. And so uh, this has just been a tremendous interview and we want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to share with us today. Uh, and uh, with that, uh, I'm going to sign off. My name again is Samuel Harrison. I am thank a, you. I am thank a, you. Thank you, Dr. Yes. Musgrove. Thank you, uh, Sam. So glad to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Yes, yes. So that's it for our session today. Everybody, listen, if you uh, have any questions or comments, reach out to us in the Facebook group. Uh, drop us a note, or if you want to reach out to Dr. Pulley, uh, send us a note. We'll make sure we get you in contact with him as well, because we're always about collaborating and, and sharing all of the benefits and expertise that we have access ability to. With that, again, I'm Samuel Harrison. I'm the owner and proprietor of Best Life Coaching LLC in the Washington metropolitan area, always pointing people to the abundance within. And I am Barbara Musgrove. You can turn your life around. Life coaching for those age 50 and older. Bye. And on behalf of Charlene Dickens, uh, CKD Design, you know what we do. 
I hope I remember it right because she's going to get me my job. <laughs> Designing first impressions that last. Designing first impressions that last. We love y'all so much. God bless. Bye-bye. God bless.